morning. Uh, I'm Tim Fitch. I am the president of the Tuxedo Community College Foundation. And as my first order of business this morning, I just want to welcome you to our annual economic conference breakfast. Uh, this is an event that we at the foundation hold every year. And our objectives this morning are twofold, and they're actually pretty simple. Uh, the first one is we want to raise some money so that we can provide scholarships to students who attend Tuxedo. And second, we want our attendees to walk away at the end of their day with at least one or two pearls of wisdom that they can use in their both professional and personal lives to help themselves. And as for that first objective of raising the money, I think I can uh, gratefully report it's mission accomplished. Uh, thanks to all of you for your generous support. You helped us reach our goal of over $60,000. So thank you all. In particular, I'd like to thank ESPN uh, for supporting the, the event as our presenting sponsor for the second year in a row. And in addition to ESPN, I'd like to extend a very special thank you to all the sponsors who made this event possible. The sponsors are listed in the program book that you should have and are on the signage and route. A little bit earlier, I had said that this event was about helping to raise money and provide scholarships. And at one level, that's true. Um, but what your contributions really do is to allow students to realize their dreams and make a better life both for themselves and for their families. And as I've learned in the 25 years that I've been associated with the foundation, small amounts here can make a very big difference in your life. But no one can explain what your dollars can mean to students who are uh, very often aspiration and commitment rich, but a little bit cash poor than one of those students who benefited from your generosity. I'd like to introduce you to one of those students in a minute. Her name is Alice Diaz. As you hear, Alice's determination and persistence has allowed her to deal with a whole bunch of curveballs that life has thrown her way. But in spite of her resolve and fortitude, without a little financial help, her pursuit of a college education would have been derailed. But as I said, she can explain this a whole lot better than I can. So without further ado, let me introduce one of Tuxus' own, Ms. Alice Diaz. Finding full-time work to support myself. 
I was devastated. It had taken me so long to get here, to where I was, to finally get back into school and to find that I was actually good at it. And now I had to choose between getting an education or basic survival. I wasn't ready to give up. I am a survivor and I was going to get through this no matter what. I informed faculty at school of my situation and everyone was eager to help in any way that they could. I refused to let the economic problem stand in my way of my education. I kept thinking if I took a semester off from school to find work, one semester would lead to two and maybe three, and I would find it harder and harder to get back to school. I'm happy to say that wasn't the case. I managed to find a small place to live where I can still attend school. Tuntis Community College and the Tuntis Community College Foundation have truly helped me get on my feet again. With the help of the dedicated faculty and professors at Tuntis, I have a work-study job that I can work around my class schedule. Then last semester, I was awarded the Helen and Gregory Sneed Scholarship, as well as the Carolyn Miranda Scholarship for, from the Tuntis Community College for my scholastic achievement. Through their generous donations, I will be able to continue my education. I only hope that one day I can sit where you are sitting and pay it forward to another student just like me. As my third semester here at Tunsi takes off, I know now that there will be a lot more struggles along the way. But as the great Frederick Douglass once said, without struggle, there is no progress. Through my own perseverance and fortitude, I have gotten here today. But through your support and generosity, the Tunsi Foundation can provide students like me with scholarships that will help shape our futures. I shall remain here and further my education. I started off with little interest furthering my education and now it's the most important part of my life. I'm starting this semester with a positive attitude and a great sense of self. I am very grateful to be here today and I thank everyone of you for your countless efforts in making it possible for me to achieve my dream. Thank you. had a distinguished career in broadcasting at graduating from the University of California, Berkeley. She began her on-air career in Columbus, Ohio, at an ABC affiliate as a reporter and later as an anchor. After a stint in Cleveland, where she won an Emmy for her work anchoring a daily talk show, Liz moved on to Boston, where among other roles, she served as an anchor and a reporter for Boston's NBC affiliate, WHDH. She then moved on to CNBC, and that's where I first saw Liz, where she served as an anchor, most recently anchoring morning call and cover to cover. During her time at CNBC, Clayman interviewed major financial newsmakers Warren Buffett, Commerce Secretary Carlos Gutierrez, and Treasury Secretary John Snow. Then in October 2007, Liz joined the Fox Business Network as an anchor, and during her time there, she's conducted interviews with a bunch of really smart and insightful guys. Guys like Ford CEO Alan uh, Mulally, Google Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt, United States Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, and Microsoft founder Bill Gates. She currently lights up the screen as the anchor of Countdown to the, morning, of the Closing Bell, which runs from 3 or 4 in the afternoon, and then immediately following that is the co anchor of After the Bell from 4 to 5. Please join me in welcoming Liz Clinton. <laughs> person in this nation should and can, can have simply by making it affordable. I too am a product of public schools all the way, high school, uh, elementary school, and of course UC Berkeley. Uh, they've lost a lot of state money. California's in 
complete disarray, and I'm, try, I'm trying to, you know, help as well, but I'm really, really moved by what's happening here in Texas when I see this entire room full of people who understand the value of education, whether it be the two-year program or a four-year program. I, I really applaud all of you. Um, so, so the title here is How the Smart Money Succeeds, and I wanted to begin simply by saying, I'm not the smart money, but I do interview very, very brilliant people who have just done an unbelievable job in every level of what they do. Um, and I feel very privileged to cover business news because coming from local news where it's good evening missiles headed our way, but first this claimant has the farm report, um, it, was, it was a big jump for me. Um, I wanted to first tell you a little bit about how I got to business news because you don't normally make that jump, but uh, I had started, I knew I always wanted to be in broadcasting. Even as a little kid, when my dad got the first video camera, I was always the one forcing my siblings to, you know, pretend they were Barbara Streisand or race car drivers, and I would do the interview. I come from a family of five. Uh, my father was the son of penniless Russian Jewish immigrants, and my mother was the daughter of penniless Romanian immigrants. And my whole childhood, they were fighting over who grew up poorer. You know, <laughs> yeah, but we didn't have running water. Yeah, but my closet was a nail on the back of the door. Huh? And with that immigrant spirit, they both succeeded. And uh, you know, my dad came from a family of nine kids, three boys, six girls. The six girls opened a beauty salon in Canada to help put the three boys through medical school. My dad and his two brothers became surgeons. My mother uh, became a formally trained theater actress. She read a quote from Shakespeare in one of her little high schools in northern Saskatchewan, Canadian. And, uh, <laughs> Somebody saw her and said, that's it, you're going, to, you're going to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. So I'm named after the Queen, Elizabeth. <laughs> like, does that mean I get to be a princess? No. <laughs> but growing up, uh, you know, my parents by then had succeeded and they moved to California, <laughs> Beverly Hills. And um, I, had a, I had a very different experience growing up there, but my father always said, I need you to understand the value of a dollar and what it means to not have what you're having. And so I, I guess he instilled in me this curiosity of telling everybody's story, from desiderata, you know, listen to everybody, even the so-called dull and ignorant, for they too have their story. That was my goal in life, is to tell those stories. So I went to my local news station, Channel 2, and offered to work for free, got an internship, and got a production assistant job, minimum wage, and all the camera guys said, start in the Midwest. Go to small markets in the Midwest where only Big Ten fans will see you make your mistakes. So uh, I sent to the Midwest and I got Columbus, Ohio, which is actually not that small a market. Worked my way up there from weekend night reporter. I mean, it was a very, it was a third rated station. You know, I think our, our, our motto was Channel 6 News. If it's news today, that's news to us. We were really bad. We were cute, but we, we got it done. There were a couple of live trucks. We had a helicopter by the time I left, and, and I really, I really cut my teeth learning how to cover everything from school board. So see, Chuck knows because Chuck Pagano, who sits on the board here, started in a small market too, and, and that's where you start turning in. You know, good evening. It could have been tragedy, but instead, it was a fender bender. <laughs> But this is what we do in local news. And I moved to Cleveland, number two station, very aggressive. This was a big Scripps Howard station. And, and I, moved, I mean, they just wanted us to get to the scene and, and get the, the signal established and be live from the plane crash. I think our motto there was News Channel 5, first at 6, correct at 11. <laughs> <laughs> from there, I went to Boston, NBC. And I learned a lot there. It was great, a very aggressive station. and. Uh, I just knew I wanted to get to either New York or Los Angeles, and I saw that the future of the world was cable. This was in the 90s. And um, I, we have agents at this level, and I told my agent, cable, cable, cable. I don't cook, I'll do the Food Channel. I don't golf, I'll do the Golf Channel. One day he calls me and he says, how about CNBC? This was 1998, before the dot-com implosion, explosion, both. And uh, he, I said, well, let me look. And I looked, I'd never really owned a stock before, and I'm looking at the ticker going by, and I'm thinking, what is that, Sanskrit? I didn't understand that. I called my dad, the doctor, and he said, Kodak, Kodak put you kids through school. Ironically, Kodak is bankrupt now, but I mean, was, <laughs> let's do some time. timing, dad, great. Um, but I thought to myself, what is life if you don't take chances? And as Teddy Roosevelt once said, if somebody asks you to do something you don't know how to do, 
say, sure I can, and then set about learning how to do that. So I accepted a freelance job, 13 weeks, and gave up my weekend anchor Boston job with parking, which is a big deal in Boston. <laughs> and uh, I moved to Fort Lee, New Jersey, Okay, that in and of itself, can we just say? Um, and uh, I started work at, at CNBC, and I went to the Liz Clayman School of Business. I studied every day, I read the journal, I read you know, Individual Investor, I read everything I could get my hands on. And uh, you know, it was 1998, people were starting to trade their own stocks. And suddenly, I'm sitting next to the most successful people in the world whether they be hedge fund managers or big financial people or people who had started a business in a garage and worked their way up. And I thought to myself, what an opportunity. And this interesting moment came when there was a commercial break. And there was a guy named Bob Dahl that I was working with. And Bob Dahl at the time was uh, head of, he was like the chief investment officer and president of Merrill Lynch. And I asked him during the commercial break, what are you doing with your money lately? Now, what do you tell your friends? And in about what the, the length of a commercial break, depending on who's advertising at five in the morning, because that was the show I did, he gave me 30 seconds of really good advice. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I have access to people who are the smartest in the world. Why don't I take that and crystallize it in my mind and pass it on to the rest of us? You know, I'm big on democracy. Why not level the playing field? So I, I basically, started to realize that I had this great opportunity to do that. I began from that day to ask truly successful people, the so-called smart money, how they succeed and how they invest. Not what stock are you putting your money in today, but what is your philosophy and how do you take money, whether it's $50 from your paycheck every month or more than that, and put it to work in a smart and relatively safe way. So if that gives you a little sense initially to start, you see this beautiful landscape behind me. That is Davos, Switzerland. And every year at the World Economic Forum, it is the biggest gathering in a tiny alpine village of world leaders for both business and politics. And when I got to Fox Business after CNBC, and that was a, a completely voluntary jump, the whole world opened up to me because there were so many more opportunities in Fox Business at a startup. I mean, I would encourage all of you, no matter what stage of your career you are at, to take chances in life. And having jumped to Fox Business, they gave me the Davos assignment, which was always the plum assignment at CNBC. And once I got there, I had access to the most powerful and most successful people in the world. So what I did, just to give you a little taste of that, was we put together from our last year, I've been three years, all the people that I've had an opportunity to be with in Davos. It's a little fun sort of music video, and after that, then I will get to what so-called smart money has said to me. Sun's up, it's a little after 12. Make breakfast for myself. Leave the work for someone else.
So, welcome to Davos. Do you think I have enough fun at my job? <laughs> Life is too short not to have fun where you work. But uh, you know, while we had a great time there, we were we were doing some some very serious discussion about about the world and everything else. So here's where I put on my glasses because you know you turn 40 and that's the end of it. Um, I have interviewed just about every Fortune 500 CEO. Some of them have since been indicted. Um, <laughs> you know, I wrote a book called The Best Investment Advice I Ever Received. It came out in 2006. I got to redo it. Three people are in prison. I mean, no, no. <laughs> uh, but all right, I'm going to pick a couple here. And by the way, I will then open it to questions. And nothing is off the table. You guys can ask me anything. I don't care how deep or how shallow it is, who does your hair every day, whatever. Doesn't matter. Don't be shy. That's what I'm here for. So at the end, we'll open it to questions. But I picked a couple of people whom I really totally respect after about, here I am now, 12 years in financial television. Wilbur Ross, I'm going to begin with him. He is a billionaire. He's the chairman of the W.L. Ross Company. They call him a vulture investor. He doesn't necessarily like that moniker, but he lives with it. What does that mean? Well, he invests in what appear to be dying, dead, or completely distressed companies or industries. But again, he, he says, why are you calling me a vulture? Why are you always picking on me? More Buffett's older and richer. Go pick on him. <laughs> But this is the man who makes treasure out of incorrectly perceived trash. In the 1990s, he started scooping up failed steel belt companies, you know, rust belt companies. Anything that had steel in it was so out of favor in the 90s. So he cobbled together $700 million from investors and from his company, and he made a massive bet on steel. He bought that Lambsdorff. Anything in Cleveland and Pittsburgh that was laying off people or closing, he bought it. He wrapped it all up, he put them together, put a shiny bow on it, called it International Steel Group, ISG, and then sold it in 2005, so just a couple of years later, to Mittal, which is an Indian steel conglomerate, for $3 billion. So let's call it 800 million investment, flips it around to $3 billion. Then he turned his sights on coal. He bought up dying coal companies in the Midwest and in the South and in the North East. If you put them together, do the same thing. I mean, this is like a uh, you know, formula here, International Coal Group, ICG. And he sold that at a huge profit. You know, he puts things together and he saves American companies. Okay, he's not one of these turnaround structure guys who just flips it around and makes it look pretty and then lets go bankrupt. He turns these companies around and saves them. Now, if you figure out coal was already looking bad, steel looked terrible. Shortly after the height of the financial crisis, he turned his attention to distressed banks and mortgage opportunities. And most recently, just had him on the show, I said, what are you looking at now, Wilbur? What are you looking at? And he said, natural gas is at multi-year lows. All anybody's saying is there's too much natural gas in this country. It's not worth anything. It's under $3 per unit. Well, it used to be $14 per unit a few years ago. But he looks and he says, wait a minute. It's so much more expensive in Europe. Okay, so what's the difference? We have a lot here. They don't have enough there. They're buying from us. So would you invest in natural gas? No. Wilbur's brain works so interestingly. He said, let me invest in the ways to get our natural gas to Europe. So most recently, he just invested in Lehman Brothers leftover tankers that transport liquid natural gas. They're literally sitting and rusting. Nobody wants them. Has the word Lehman on it. Toxic, right? No way. He is now investing in that because he knows. He looks in a crystal ball. He has Wilbur vision. And he looks out there and he says, I don't, I don't necessarily want to invest in natural gas. Yeah, that's true. There is a lot of it. But I'll invest in the way to get it to the places where they will pay more for it. This from a guy who grew up in Weehawken, New Jersey. His mom was a school teacher worked in a radio station in college to pay his way through school, and then he decided to become an expert in bankruptcy, which is perfect, trash into treasure, but he puts the twist on it. He doesn't just let the companies go under. He fixes them and makes them valuable again. So how does he do that? All right? Because I said, hey, Wilbur, that's great. You're genetically predisposed to figuring out not being scared, right? Well, when the herd is running away from something, he looks and says, what are they running away from? He starts sniffing around. 
he goes in the complete opposite direction of the stock stampede. Here's what he told me. He said, Liz, throughout my career, I've taken the road less traveled. People thought there was no way that a steel industry could make any profit at all in the United States, especially shortly after he started to do it. You know, the auto industry started to falter. They needed less steel. They were moving to aluminum. Everything looks bad. Um, no, it doesn't. He figures out a way, knowing, identify something that everybody needs or eventually might want. Okay, steel. But wait, look for that thing when it's out of favor, not in favor. Coal, steel. Once you see that, go there. Put your money there because it's cheap. You don't want to buy things that are expensive. He said, we approached it like this. People will always need steel, right? But we noticed that the companies, and I thought this was interesting, the companies in a given industry more or less will tend to go bad or go south simultaneously. What I try to do is I look for the one company or the two companies that appear to be worth salvaging, sort of the best and second best in class. But how do you do that? Well, there's no way around research and then experience. So yeah, you actually have to do homework. You have to look in and see who, you know, who has who has the brain power, who has the smart money, who has the good facilities that are also getting caught in the downcraft. He said, our job is to figure out whether there is one or two that are worth salvaging. No way around hard work and research. Now listen to this part about what Wilbur Ross really said. You need to avoid, like the plague, whatever is the most popular thing at the time. The biggest danger for the small investor is to get sucked up in the flavor of the month. Don't get caught in the bubbly and the froth of the markets. Now, that bubbly froth, it looks alluring. Right before Facebook went public, how 800 million people using it, all of your friends, how could this ever go wrong? That's called bubbly and froth. It's dangerous in there. Avoid it, especially if everyone you know, even successful and wealthy people, are doing it. Does that take guts? Oh, yes. Does it take fortitude? I mean, we're all nervous, right? But I asked him once how the little guy out there can do what he does on a smaller scale. He said, look for good companies going through bad times. So during the height of the financial crisis, I'm sitting there with my co-anchor, David Asman, and I'm looking at Starbucks and I'm thinking, it's an $8 stock. What happened, man? I mean, everybody was so big on Starbucks in the late 90s. It fell to $8 a share in about 2009. Then the announcement comes while I'm on the air, Starbucks is closing six hundred stores in the U.S. They gotta shut them down. Can't afford to keep them running. They closed 600 stores. They canned the CEO and brought back Howard Schultz, their original and, and very, very exciting leader. So total drama, very opaque outlook. Ugh, I don't want to be near that company, right? Eight dollar stock, scary time. But ask yourself, is Starbucks really gonna go away? 16,000 stores, they had 17,000. So now they've got 16,000 worldwide. But just because people were nervous at that time about buying a $5 latte because the financial crisis was scaring everybody, does that mean Starbucks was gonna be wiped off the face of the earth? You gotta take a guess. Our guess was no. Today, Starbucks, at least the close of Friday's session, around $50 a share. $2,098, today 50. I would say that's a pretty good return over three years. Welcome to Wilbur World. Uh, that's how you do it on a smaller basis, he said. Now I'll get to Bill Gross of PIMCO. Bill, Bill Gross, many of you may know him, some of you may not. He's a big investor out in California. He runs PIMCO, which is a big sort of bond and investment conglomerate. Started with nothing, worked his way up. $270 billion in his PIMCO total return fund now. He runs it. That's a very nice total return. When I asked Bill Gross the same question that I had asked Wilbur Ross, here's what he said. The best investment advice I ever received, which I follow and has helped me make billions for investors, hangs on my office wall under the two pictures of the two financial wizards who wrote them. The first is from an investor named Bernard Baruch. Now, personally, I did not know who that was. But he was a famous investor in the 20s and 30s who sold out at the very top. 
okay, so right before the Great Depression, and then gained influence in the FDR administration as one of the big economic advisors there. The second was from an investor named Jesse Livermore, a speculator during the exact same time period. He made a million dollars seven times in a row and lost that million seven times later, only to blow his brains out in a hotel bathroom, right? Lovely, some role model, right? But let me go back to the first guy. Baruch said, whatever men attempt, they seem to overdo. When hopes are soaring, that's a bull market, right? I always repeat to myself that two plus two still equals four, and no one ever invented a way of getting something for nothing. So now you're trying to understand human nature. When the outlook is steeped in pessimism, bear market, I, meaning Bill Gross, always remind myself that two plus two equals four, and that you can't keep mankind, especially America, down for long. Now the Baruch quote is a classic reference to going against the grain when things get euphoric or excessively pessimistic. So a little bit of a twist on the Wilbur Ross thing. I mean, Wilbur's a different kind of animal. He only goes to stuff nobody wants. But Bill's talking about timing. Now listen to this part about what he told him. I have found that money is made over the long term by riding the wave of the crowd for 75 to 80% of the time. Okay, so if everybody's pouring into something, try and figure it out 70 to 80% of the time. This is not market timing, by the way. Market timing is something different, but 70 to 80% of the time, the crowd is the dominant force in a bull market. So if you're gonna fight that, you're swimming against the tide and you're not gonna win. But you can't perpetually get something for nothing and the ability to get off that majority good wave, even a little bit early, is critical to preserving capital for the next bull market. And the same applies to jumping in during points of excessive pessimism. So when things are getting more fearful and more fearful and then everybody jumps out, you jump in. How do you do this? Well, now let's get to the second guy. Livermore said it best. An investor has to guard against many things, most of all, himself. The secret to getting off and back into the wave of the crowd is to separate yourself psychologically, this is Bill talking now, from what is going on, to be hopeful when there's fear, and fearful when there's too much hope. You can only do that by analyzing your own personality, how you react under pressure, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, and then you kind of have to fight against some of those emotions. I mean, how many times have we looked at something and said, wait, I really wanted that, but now everybody's running away from it, so forget it, I will too. No, go the other way. Put yourself on an investor psychiatrist couch, Bill says. Analyze yourself, then take that knowledge to help you ride the market's way for much of the time and then safely exit for the balance. 75 to 80% of the time, Okay, everybody's jumping into treasury bonds. All right, I'm not gonna fight that. But then, just as your taxi driver says he's doing it, get out. We always talk about the taxi driver indicator. A taxi driver said to me once, so yeah, I'm flipping condos in Boca Raton. Okay, top of the real estate market. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's another way that the smart money does it. Now I'm gonna talk about David Swenson. David Swenson not a very well-known name for anybody outside of big endowment funds and huge investment, but he is the chief investment officer of the Yale University Endowment Fund. He is big time rock star famous when it comes to investing. After six years on Wall Street, he went to Yale in about 1985 to help run their endowment. He brought it from $1 billion to $19 billion. He is known to have the best returns over, over the years than any other endowment fund except maybe Thompson's. <laughs> hey, we can all learn from David, right? David Swenson gives maybe one interview every five years. He does not like to give interviews. I am very honored and proud to say he's given me three. Um, might be the red hair, I don't know. But I mean, I really feel that when I do an interview, I listen. I listen to people. It's not about me trying to show off how smart I am. It's not about six anchors meeting up on a, on a single CEO. CNBC, um, and, and it is about the fact that I love business and I want to hear what they have to say, and I also want to be a conduit of them to you, to the viewer, and I think that's really important, and I think that's maybe why David Swenson has been so open to me. Um, I 
I dedicated an entire chapter of my book that I have written to him. Um, but he is widely credited with redefining the model of institutional investing. Institutional investing is not us. It's not us on a TD Ameritrade account. It's, it's basically investing in illiquid and different types of financial instruments that some of us do not have access to. But he also favors a very long-term view, which I would encourage a lot of us to have. He told me that one book had a profound effect on him. It was by a guy named Charlie Ellis, and it's called Winning the Loser's Game. What a great title, Winning the Loser's Game, because you know what? In the stock market, it's very hard to win that game. It's like the house always wins, and who is the house? The house is the market, and it is such a huge force, very hard to win. He advises, and you are going to like this, that index funds, do you know what index funds are? Basically, it's buying the S&P 500, buying the NASDAQ, buying the Dow Jones Industrials. Index funds ought to form the core of a portfolio. You're not paying any fees to a fancy financial guy. You just own the market. This is based on the notion, he says, that the market return is a very tough hurdle to beat. He says, don't just expose yourself, though, to US indices, emerging markets, are the spice, this is his quote, the spice that makes the stew interesting. Having a five to 10% allocation to emerging markets like Asia, Africa even, and now you have these things called exchange traded funds which are baskets of stocks. So if you were to buy an ETF of South Africa, of Southern African countries, Sub-Saharan, you get the best in class companies, Sub-Saharan. And that way you don't have to sit there and do all the research. I mean, you always should do your own research, but you can buy baskets of stocks with a better shot at doing well. Asia, Africa, the Middle East even, Central Europe, Latin America, it makes an enormous amount of difference, just five to seven to 10% in your portfolio. David told me he never chases performance. What does that mean? We start looking, you say, oh, that fund returned 19% last year, that's amazing. Very little chance it's gonna do that again. Don't change performance. He said that's a major mistake. And again, people make the same mistake over and over again. My dad used to say, learn from the mistakes, not just that you make, but from those of others. Save you a lot of time. Individuals do this consistently and overwhelmingly. They chase performance. It is a mistake and it is very damaging to returns. He said, you need to be in the market day in and day out, even through the scary times even through the rep time. So how, here's my question, how do you fight the fear when everything seems to be tanking? Like I'm thinking 2008, 2009. It's called dollar cost averaging. On a monthly basis, and David Swenson really supports this, pick a fixed amount, whether it's $50 from your paycheck, $10, who cares, just start doing it, and automatically commit it to the markets, or as he suggests, the indices. He does not like mutual funds. You're paying a fee, to some guy, and more often than not, they're barely outperforming or underperforming the markets. So he's got a little bit of Wilbur Roth's genetic string in there, just a little bit, fighting the herd, but he and another famous investment expert named Burton Malkiel, who wrote a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. He, he's a professor at Princeton, it's a great book. It's, it's a classic, he's, he's redone it several times. Uh, are, are two of my favorites because their advice fits basically most of us out there. Professor Malkiel's theory, and I'm not kidding, this is his theory, and he, he studied it, is that a monkey throwing darts at a stock chart can do just as well, if not outperform, the guy you're paying. I swear, he did a whole theory on that. It's unbelievable. We used to take a bunch of journalists from the Wall Street Journal, because I thought, let's do something like a video version of this, and we'd get a dark board of a stock chart, and we'd have them pick stocks by throwing darts at the board, and then we'd follow that stock for three months. And I'm not kidding you, more often than not, did pretty well, or not. But the fact is that you don't want to be paying somebody 1.5% or 2% to run a mutual fund that's not really doing that well. So that's what David Swenson says. And this is a guy who has had unbelievable returns. You want to look at the ones and take the advice from the smart money. And finally, I'll get to arguably the greatest investor of our time, Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway. <clears throat> when I first got to CNBC in 1998, Warren Buffett was not what he is today. Although very few people knew about him unless you were an expert in so-called value investing, which is his form of investing. But <clears throat> my co-anchor Bob Sellers at the time, and this is 1998, 
one day a stock chart popped up with Berkshire Hathaway Barnes Company and it, and it said $60,000 a share. Now every other stock was either 15 or 25 or 105. And Bob said to me in the commercial break, that wasn't a typo, it wasn't a miscue on the chart. He just has never split his stock. But he's known as this kind of quirky guy out in Omaha, Nebraska, like Omaha, whatever. And he said, no, he doesn't leave Omaha. He doesn't like New York, he doesn't like Wall Street. Uh, but he's one of the richest men in the world. He doesn't give interviews. Okay, fine. Next year, doesn't give interviews. Next year, doesn't give interviews. He did one interview uh, on a charity lunch that he was doing, I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, it just didn't, I didn't look at it. Oh, he bought Dairy Queen. Oh, isn't that cute? Ha uh, He has this annual shareholder meeting. He needs a Dilly Mart. It's just like, he seemed like a quirky guy. One day, I was still at CNBC. They came to me and they said, here's the deal. We want every anchor to land a big interview for the midterm elections. And I thought, well, let me get that guy Warren Buffett. So I, I got the number, and <laughs> I pick up the phone, I call, and you know, Berkshire Hathaway, and, and I said, hi, it's Liz Clayman from Fox Business. I, I want to talk to Warren Buffett. Now, I knew that he wasn't giving interviews. And she said, well, uh, okay, puts me through to the next assistant. And she said, oh, Liz, uh, Mr. Buffett doesn't, is not giving any interviews at this time. But one of the things that I learned in local news is, quiet. So I was just silent. I didn't say, okay, or well, wait a minute. I was just silent. That was a very awkward moment. She said, oh, he is such a fan of yours. Hold on. <laughs> I thought to myself, whoa, 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 wait a minute, it's so exciting. So um, all of a sudden, he picked up, he said, hi, Liz, I just finished watching you because I just got off the air. I was doing the 11 a.m. at that time. It was about noon. And I said, yeah, how'd I do? And he said, you did pretty well. And we started talking, and I'm thinking, this is going great. And I said, you know, Warren, we're, we're doing this, this thing uh, leading up to the election. I don't know what the elections are going to do. I said, well, you know, as far as the economy is concerned, I don't know what the economy is going to do. No, I'm not giving an interview on the economy. Now I'm starting to feel a little panicked. And I said, well, you know, the markets have been through. I don't know what the markets are going to do. He shut me down. So I thought, you know how, you know, sink or swim. So I said, what does this guy care about? He cares about his companies that he buys. So I said, how about this? How about I come to Omaha, Nebraska? Because I knew he wasn't going to go to a fixed camera in some, some studio, and I knew he wasn't coming to New York. I said, why don't I come to Omaha, and you can tell me how you value a business. And he said, well, let, let me think about this. Where are you going to be later? And I gave him my home number. So I went home. I used to wake up at three in the morning back then. I did the early show, and um, I, I said, uh, I, you know, I used to take a nap because I was up so early. So I went to sleep. Two o'clock, phone rings. Hello. Hi, Liz. It's Warren. I said, Oh, right. Yeah, hi, Warren. Warren Buffett's calling me at my house, and he said, Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, Now I'm thinking, what did Bob say? He's very down to earth. He said, I said, Well, I'm, I am very down to earth. And he said, Really? Where are you from? <laughs> I said, Beverly Hills, with an explanation. And he said, what's the explanation? I said, um, my father grew up very poor, taught us the value of a dollar. And he said, really, where did he grow up? I said, Canada, but he was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants. And one said, I bought my two best businesses from Russian Jewish immigrants. And I'm thinking, finally, it's good to be Jewish. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, finally, it's the spin up. So um, we talked and talked, and he said, all right, well, why don't you come? Then he hangs up. I'm thinking, does he, he's old, does he understand I'm gonna bring an entourage with cameras and then I'm in a full blown panic. I can't go back to CNBC and say, I got an interview with Warren Buffett and then I get there and he's, what is this, what are these cameras? You know, I was, I was incorrectly thinking of him as some bumpkin or hazy. So I thought, I thought, I said, okay, I'm gonna call back. Call back and said to the assistant, Debbie, I said, um, do you need the names of my entire seven person crew for security reasons at the building? Because it was post 9 11 here in New York, you have to show 12 pieces of ID. I said, do you need, you need, uh, do you need everybody's names to run their social security numbers and all of that? Dead silence. She says, no. No, I'm thinking, okay, man. She doesn't get it. I'm thinking, they don't get it. They, don't. they got it. So we went. I didn't know what I'd get. I thought I'd get five minutes. He gave us seven hours. He took us to the Nebraska Furniture Mart, which is the first company he bought uh, from Rose Blumkin, who was a, a 
Russian Jewish immigrant who started with, by selling her own furniture in her basement because she couldn't afford to live. Uh, and then he shows Borsheim's jewelry, uh, which was another one. And that was the first of 38 interviews Warren Buffett has granted me since 2006. So let me get to the smartest of the smart money and what he said. Number one, here's how he invests. He only invests in things that have certain characteristics and rules, and he never, ever wavers from those rules. I came from a family where my dad says, if you don't bend, you're going to break. You'll become a dinosaur. That's not how Warren Buffett thinks. <coughs> he only invests, number one, in a company he understands. After reading the prospectus, if he doesn't understand it, he will not spend a penny on it. He went, here's an example, went all the way up to the Canadian oil sands because he told me that his best friend, Bill Gates, uh, thought they might be a good investment, and Bill has a fantastic return, fantastic return on his money uh, for, his, for his, um, his funds and things that he puts together. So Warren schleps up to the uh, Canadian oil sands in Alberta in 2008 with Bill Gates, meets a bunch of people, gets a tour, gets the, the full-on explanation of all about the Canadian oil sands, he reads up on it, he studies it, and to this day, he has never invested a penny in the Canadian oil sands. He said, Liz, I didn't get it. I didn't understand. They seem to be spending a lot of money to extract a single barrel of oil, and there was a lot of environmental damage, and I, I just thought to myself, I, I don't get it yet. It may eventually be a great business, and I will have missed out on it, but it's not right for me. But while he was up there, he did see one thing that he did understand, and that was a bunch of trains going in and going out, and moving the product and moving all of the equipment in and out. He understood trains very well. He saw opportunity there, and so after studying it and looking at all of the trends, he bought an entire railroad from to Northern. He only buys stocks in something that he sees as an impressive business. He looks at the intrinsic value of that business. How does he do that? With old-fashioned research, just like Wilbur Ross. He pours through SEC filings, which any of you can do on their website. He reads the prospectus, any of you can order it. He reads annual reports, they're all online. And he often says he reads annual reports like he reads like other people read Playboy. He gets so excited about them. <laughs> but then he asks himself, do I get it? Do I get this business? Is it a great product? Is it first or second in class? That's why he bought Coca-Cola, not Pepsi. He wanted to buy first in class. And finally, what is the price of it right now? He never, ever overpays for a stock or a company. His entire focus is to buy great companies, but has to be at a cheap or discounted price. Even if he is absolutely in love with a company, he never pays full price ever. He waits sometimes years, and then if a competitor comes in and bids him up, if he's buying a whole company outright, he walks away, period. So if you're in love with the Lululemon stock, or, or Google, or Apple, you name it, whatever stock, you must absolutely wait until the price to earnings ratio, the price of the stock versus their forward earnings, comes down, even if that means you have to wait for a crisis, and then yes, bring out your inner Wilbur Ross and jump in. And then you find what you're really made of. Are you the smart money? You know, they often say at the New York Stock Exchange, that the stock exchange is the only place where when they put out a big for sale sign, everyone runs away. Now think about it. You have your eye on a flat screen TV. Let's just pick out a, a, a company, Samsung. Oh, it's at 42 inch. You've wanted it for so long, but it's $5,000. Suddenly, somebody says, hey, uh, for a brief period of time, it's going to be $2,900. What would you do? OK, I've been waiting. I'm in. Let's get it. But the complete opposite happens often with people when the stock does the same thing. Samsung stock at X dollars suddenly going through a crisis, whether it be financial, global, or a problem with management of the company, it falls. I'm not touching Samsung. Don't be like that. The smart money says, wait for the sale and then get in. Why do we think like that? Why do we behave like that? I'm telling you in this room, try in the future when you're looking to invest like the smart money. They're the ones who say, yeah, now it's on sale. Instead of back and like saying Starbucks at $8, forget it. I only wish, because I am like the rest of you, I get scared that I sat there with my co-anchor and said, Ford's $5. Ford's now 10 or 15, depending on which day we're looking at it. Starbucks $8. And we looked at, yeah, Starbucks isn't going away. Ford's not going away. We always laugh about this years later. David and I, we didn't buy it. 
because we're not the smart money, but I'm trying years later to be the smart money and to jump in at a time when everybody's running away. I've actually gotten better at it. I'm going to close with the poet Robert Frost who wrote, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. loudly and again you can ask me anything and so please don't be shy I'd love to hear from all of you we've got about 10 minutes for questions who's got one Chuck come on break the ice oh you got one okay go ahead So that's Fox Business. We came in behind CNBC, which had 20 years on us, and behind Bloomberg, which had 15 years on us. And we thought we can do business news better. Uh, it is a different era now. And the first thing that our management felt that when we did business news in the morning was we were really struggling. And Don Imus uh, suddenly became a guy without a network, and we thought, and we still believe that, that he will bring in a different group of investor viewers, and his numbers are now beating Squawk Box. Um, and we hope that because we have data on the screen, we have the ticker, we, we have the news cuttings every nine minutes, uh, where we bring in all of the breaking business news and, and all of the research and all of the things that, that do matter to the investor, that we will maybe convert more people. It's a it's a management decision, and you know I. I Look at those numbers and I think, wow, we are beating Squawk Box in the demo. The demo is sort of that 18 to 54. Personally, I think older folks have more money and are now more successful at their age and, and, and their stage of life. And, and that, that's the viewer I'd like to reach. But uh, that's what Madison Avenue does, 18 to 54 right now. We're, you know, we haven't, we haven't changed their ways, but um, it's working. So I'm hoping that uh, we can convert some of you and, and hopefully come along, but I do understand your frustration because we've heard from a lot of people who feel the same way you do. So you're not, you're not wrong in your emotion, definitely. Krispy Kreme, 
you know, you name it, there have been a FedEx started during a recession. Come on, you know, if you're gonna sit there and look at all the vicissitudes and the ups and downs of the economy, you're letting, you're letting the leash drag you around versus you dragging the leash. You know, it, it's really, of course you have to pay some attention to the economy, definitely. I mean, it, it's a reality of life. But I saw an interesting statistic. Somebody said, oh, the most recent study of all businesses said that the, their biggest worry and the reason they're not investing right now is because of uncertainty. Okay, then somebody else said, since that study has been done, for the past 32 years, the number one worry that they always, always listed was uncertainty. There's always gonna be uncertainty. What are you gonna do, hide in your room and not, not take a chance in life? I mean, how would ESPN have ever started if people felt like that? How would CNBC have ever started? Fox Business, Rupert Murdoch started with one newspaper. His father's, he inherited it, he grew it to, to what we have now, the most powerful cable network in the world, Fox News. I mean, it's unbelievable. And they came in behind MSNBC and CNN and won. Another Splenda Network kind of thing. Google came in behind Microsoft Explorer and Yahoo. Look at Google. The smartest people in the room. It's unbelievable. They, they went from a search engine to making phones, Androids that are selling 200,000 a day worldwide. If they worried about the economy and when the dot-com thing blew up in 2000, they'd all be hiding in their rooms and working for somebody else. Uh, so yeah, you can worry about the economy and not overspend. I think that it should crimp behavior a little bit, but it doesn't mean that you, you don't take chances in like Intel. Intel, the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer, started in Silicon Valley, three guys. You know, Andrew Grove, Gordon Moore, Craig Barrett, these guys, sitting around in Berkeley, California, trying to figure out how to make microchips. Look at them today, they own 80% of the market share. And at the height of the financial crisis, Paul O'Leary, the CEO said to me, we have dry powder, we're now spending it on research and development. And we're building up our capital expenditures. They built a brand new plant. Uh, they, they took advantage. So you always keep that little bit of dry powder for those moments when everyone else is running away. But yeah, I think the economy is of a concern, but it should never paralyze any of us, ever. Because guess what? There are gonna be a whole lot more recessions in our lifetime. That's what Buffett says. He says, I've been through seven recessions and I've, I've managed to survive all of them. And you know, Buffett started, by the way, um, with a little bit of money that he got from walking door to door in his neighborhood, asking his parents' friends, will you let me invest your money? I've graduated from Columbia Business School. His Aunt Katie, gave him $25,000, my God, in 1968, that was all the money in the world. It was all she had. She said, you know, to her nephew, try not to lose it, just, just keep it at what it is. Keep it at what it is. When she died, she had $8 billion. <laughs> he told me once, he said, you know, Aunt Katie in her older years, as elderly people get nervous about, do I have enough money, do I have enough money? And they, they can't, they have trouble wrapping their minds around how much they'll have, or they don't know how long they're gonna live. And, she kept um, calling him and saying, Warren, is, is, is there enough money to, to pay for my, you know, for my home health care, this and that? And he'd say, uh, and Katie, you've got nothing to worry about because in exactly 18,353 years, the money's gonna run out. <laughs> Eight million dollars. And there you are. This isn't rich people starting, you know, on third base. This is people who took chances in life. And, I, and I've really learned that, you know, and, and you know, for somebody like me, I grew up privileged, unlike my father and my mother. And you know, my dad used to say to me, I gave you kids every advantage except disadvantage. Because there is a huge advantage to fighting for something that you really want. And so I told myself I was gonna have to kind of manufacture in a, in a Petri dish that, that fight. And I did it by going into broadcast television where they're about 3,000 Miss Americas who are dying to do what we do. And uh, I thought, how am I gonna get to the top? You know, here's Columbus, here's Fort Smith, Arkansas. You know, they've all got markets and television stations that are doing first and sixth correct at 11. And, 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 I, and I thought, how am I gonna establish myself? And the way I did it was by jumping into something about which I knew nothing. And everybody told me I was crazy to go to CNBC, except one person.
my dad, who took chances in life. But everybody else, I asked some really smart people in the business, my old news director at Channel 2, he said, man, you worked hard to get where you are in Boston. I don't think this is it, Liz. My husband, who was at the time my fiance, and he was at MSNBC as a producer, he, he was so scared. He said, you don't do consumer news. As a consumer, that I can do. I got to do stock news. And he said, well, then don't do it. And I said, wait a minute. What about Teddy Roosevelt? Take a chance at life. So uh, that's how I feel. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that was Orit, she runs Bain and Company. Um, there are not a lot of women who run companies uh, at the Fortune 500 level, uh, very few. More here and there. Uh, they make a big deal of the CEO of Campbell Soup and the CEO of uh, Frontier uh, Communications because they're sisters, that's highly unusual. So I did an interview with the two of them and said, what's in the water where you guys grew up? Yeah, we're CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and you know what, it goes back to their dad. I, I know I reference my dad a lot. My mother helped me a lot too with, with, you know, sort of the cosmetics of it all and the enunciation and using good grammar. That's hugely important. Um, but but they said that their father, every night at the dinner table, would ask them to challenge themselves mentally. And he'd bring up topics and he'd say, let's let's talk about what's going on in the Middle East. What would you do? What what are your solutions? Let's talk, you know. Dad, I'm in twelfth grade. What do you want me to do? Um, but. <laughs> You stretch your children's minds. To this day, I try and do that with my kids. I never ask closed-end questions. I never ask, ask questions of my kids that can be answered with yes or no. Um, my dad used to never say, how was your day? Fine. He'd say, what's the best thing that happened to you today? You know? I mean, uh, you can really start early with, with children and, and take a chance, but it is never too late. And, and that's, you know, that's, I said, how did that happen? Um, I am a feminist, big time. I'm a member of the Feminist Majority Foundation, but in my opinion, being really pro-women is not about giving them a chance when they don't deserve it. I'm big on meritocracy. I don't care if you're male, female, or Martian. You better deserve that job. You better work very hard for that job because it hurts morale. You promote somebody who didn't deserve to be there. I'm big on that, you know, and that's why I love Fox. It's so fascinating to me because as you know, I went to Berkeley. I grew up, you know, my father wanted to legalize prostitution and marijuana. He's like, take the profit out. He's really liberal. Um, and when Fox called, I was like, wait, aren't you guys uh, kind of, uh, no. You come here and you say whatever you want. I said, well, you know, I went to Berkeley. I've hugged trees. That's great. Come on over. To this day, I have never been told what to say, how to say it. I call a spade a spade. You know, since President Obama, has been president, the stock market is up 43%. Now the economy and the stock market are two different things. The economy is still definitely faltering and, and anybody, look, you heard from Alice's story, it only got worse and worse and worse, it didn't get better. Uh, that, that is reflected uh, for a lot of Americans today. Um, but you know, when you're looking at investment in 401ks and pensions, man, they have reflated, thank God. Um, and so somebody's doing something. I, I thought it was pretty funny. The Journal did a piece on a guy named, you know, I'm not going to say his name because I can't remember, but he's a billionaire. He's very, very, very conservative. Really dislikes the president. And in this article, he was talking about how it was during the primaries. He was giving a million to Santorum and a million to Romney and a million to anybody. You know, Gingrich, he just, he's sort of anybody but Obama. And um, then the article goes on to say, this guy, worth in 2006 four billion dollars and today is worth 10 billion dollars blah 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 and they go on in the story i'm thinking really so the president was that bad <laughs> <laughs> well how did six billion happen um steve Wynn of Wynn resorts does not like the president his stock continues to hit all time highs on a daily basis i look at it, oh, there's Wynn resorts moving higher once again so I really am the true living version of fair and balanced. I call it spade a spade, and I call, I call it as I see it, but uh, that's why I love Fox Business. You know, they say to me, you keep doing what you're doing. You're fair, you're good. Uh, unlike some other places where it was, well, she's sort of been the one that everybody knows, so she gets Davos, and she's gonna get the good assignments. It's a really great thing in this world to work in a meritocracy, and, 
that's where I feel I am now. I feel like I'm finally home uh, at Fox, which is great, and Fox Business. But again, I did take that chance. A lot of people said to me, why would you go to the third in business network? They're never going to win. Well, we just got demographic numbers. We're October, uh, October um, 15th, we're going to be five years old, and um, our demographics are growing depending. By the way, I'm up 80% uh, in demographics. CNBC, in that same time period, up 10%. But in market day, we're up 68%, and CNBC is down 10%. Now, you tell me, how does a 24-year-old business network how does that happen where the little guy, the David versus the Goliath, comes in and I'm thinking to myself, wow, we're not there yet, but I'm so proud to have taken a dive into water. I didn't know how shallow or how deep. I just know that glory goes to those who take chances in life. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, good morning, Mike. Hi, this is Mitchell. Everyone uh, born in the 40s has all the money and they're going to start selling their stock. What's the market on that? The retail investor is not in the market right now. I believe the latest data I saw was that $300 billion has been pulled out of the markets because people are scared. And by the way, Facebook didn't help. Um, Facebook scared people so much they felt that, that the playing field was not level and that the smart money pulled their money out early. Well, sure they did, because they did the opposite of what everybody else was doing. Um, if I had a crystal ball and I propelled, let's call it eight to 10 years in the future, we will look back on this time and say, this was the time to have gotten into the stock market. You can account America out. Are you kidding me? You're going to count American ingenuity and business out? Uh, you can't even believe the companies that I cover and how every day they're trying to come up with ideas and solutions to the hacker. Okay, what a mess, right? I was just there live. We got an exclusive interview with Meg Whitman, who's now the CEO. And I, I mean, I just, I went into the old offices of Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. They still have them exactly as they were. It was like something out of Mad Men. And I mean, you're talking decades ago, and this is a company that started in a garage. Yes, they have preserved the garage. It's a National Historic Landmark. You're going to count out Hewlett Packard? Now, you could also go the other way and say, yeah, Liz, but what about Bear Stearns? Bear Stearns is gone. Lehman Brothers gone. I, I used to pass that building every single day going to work at Fox. It's right in Times Square. Now it's his Barclays. I'm thinking to myself, oh my god. But on balance, there is no downside to reasonable optimism about America, especially. Uh, so I would say that that's the herd pulling their money out. I'm in. You know, I really am. One more question? Yes, sir. Hi, Kevin Martinez from ESPN. Um, I'm just curious, there's a question here somewhere, but uh, when you look at CEOs and you look at Davos and you look at the change in globalization, where does sustainability funds and corporate social responsibility play into smart money? Um, let me just first say that um, that's a fantastic question. And um, I should also tell you that Disney has hit 18 new highs this year in their stock, your parent company, so bravo. Um, corporate responsibility and a corporate conscience. Of course, me, bleeding for liberal. Um, I we think it makes good business sense. One of the people that you saw that you may not have recognized because he's not necessarily household name on that Davos take was uh, Stan, um, his name is Stan Bergman. He's the CEO of a company called Henry Shine. They're the world's largest uh, medical products and doctor's office and, and veterinary office. They, they, they supply everything from wipes to needles to everything. Like anything in your dentist's office came from Henry Shine. They order it online. They spend an inordinate amount of time and money. When the tsunami hit, they sent mobile trucks there with all the health equipment and emergency equipment. Anytime there's a disaster, earthquakes, you name it, they ship in big C-130s their stuff at the total cost of their own company, and they get out there and they help. That company has grown from a $700 million company to, I believe, around a $5 billion market cap 
over just a small period of time, and I truly believe it's because they don't just sit there and think about the almighty dollar. Um, I think that right now, corporations are looking for causes like Texas. I would hit up everybody in a you know thousand mile radius and say, public education matters. Corporations get it these days. They understand, they see what's going on with all of the, you know, you look at how much students owe in student loans. This is a crisis. More is owed in student loans, and Fox Business, I absolutely say, has been ahead of the forefront of waving a major red flag about this to watch out for. Student loans are now bigger than auto loans and credit card loan debt put together. This is a gigantic bubble. It's already bursting. Kids get out of college, they can't find a job, they can't pay off their student loans. I don't know if you saw the piece in the New York Times, a 56-year-old guy still owes 20,000 or 30,000, gets bigger and bigger. This is, this is a crisis of epic proportions, and these people know who run companies that unless they're part of the solution, they'll be part of the problem. And uh, you know, maybe that's Thompson's next goal in life, is to hit up every major company and hedge fund and say, just give us five minutes of your time. This is a crisis. Help us let kids go to school without a gigantic, gloomy cloud over their head of debt. And you'll start to see the payoff in a very short amount of time. Uh, I really feel strongly about this. That's why I'm part of a major fundraising campaign at UC Berkeley. I mean, they're clueless. They don't know how to raise money. Uh, they, they've always gotten a ton of money from the state. We used to get $500 million in the state of California. Within the blink of an eye, California cut off 200 million and 250. Then I get the call. I got the call my second year at Fox. I say, hi, um, yeah, you know, you went to Berkeley, we want to meet with you. And I said, where have you guys been? Where have you been? I called you when I was at CNBC. Uh, Peter Sherman, who ran Fox Entertainment, he's a Berkeley graduate. He said he walked in, he was shooting a movie or something up in Oakland, and he walked into the alumni office and said, do you guys need any of my help? They're like, no, no, we're good, thanks. You know, Berkeley's won 21 Nobel Prizes. That's, they were like, well, you didn't discover the last element on the periodic chart, you forget it, you're not smart enough, you're just, just a newscaster. Well, then they started calling because they got smart. You know, necessity's the mother of invention. They called me, they called Peter, and what did we do? We stepped up to the plate. Apollo Lee, you've been telling, a Berkeley graduate. Where have you guys been? Here's a million dollars. I mean, that's lucky, obviously, you can tell. But, um, you know, John Riccatello of uh, Electronic Arts, I, I, I picked up the phone, I said to the people at Berkeley, you guys don't even know what you're doing. Look and see every CEO who ever stepped foot in Berkeley, call them up and say, you owe, a certain, to a certain extent, you owe part of your success to the experience you had at Berkeley. <clears throat> what did they do? They were like, oh, okay, sure. Joe Jimenez of Novartis, he went to grad school there. Come on, this is not brain surgery. And then we got people like uh, the, the, the general manager of the Mets, Sandy Alderson, to sit on the board. He didn't even go to Berkeley. People get it. They get it. But you gotta ask. I'm honored to be part of this. So ask me anything you guys ever need, and I'll be here for you at Toxis. Thank you. Chair of the committee that put this uh, 
done together. And um, without him and the work of that committee, uh, this wouldn't have been the success that it is. And again, we measure the success kind of in one way in terms of dollars, but also in the way that the number of lives that it will affect. So, Chuck, to you and your committee, thank you very much.